Hello, we are from team FRC7431 Wigspan from Vieira, Florida. Um, welcome to our presentation about diversity, equity, inclusion, and how you can apply them to your team. Uh, as far as introductions go, uh, there's two of us. My name is Sid, I use they, them pronouns, and I am the chief of operations on my team, which means I'm in charge of, um, sorry, which means I'm in charge of awards and um, non-financial business endeavors. And um, I am Ale. I also use they, them pronouns, and I am the, one of the team's first alumni. I actually was the chief of operations last year when I was still on the team. Uh, so this is our first time giving this presentation, and we're both a little nervous, but we really hope that uh, by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to learn a little bit about how to make your team an inclusive environment. Um, we want you to send in your questions, uh, but we won't be able to answer them all until the end. We have a Q&A portion. All right. So in this presentation, we will um, cover what are diversity, equity, and inclusion, the experiences of student minority groups in STEAM, and how to be a good ally. All right, so let's start off with what are diversity, equity, and inclusion? What they mean and why they matter. So what do these words mean, all right? A lot of people have heard about diversity. A lot of people have heard about inclusion but it's that equity part that gets people a little confused. And some people, they see diversity, equity, and inclusion, and they think they mean all, all of the, they think that all of them mean the exact same thing, which is not true. So let's get into these definitions. Diversity is the inclusion of different types of people within an organization. This can be people of different races, cultures, gender identities, abilities, and more. Now, there are two different definitions for equity that people generally use. Um, one definition is that equity is equality. But the other definition, the one that I like to use, is that equity is the steps that someone must take before we finally reach equality. So equity is the process of making sure all opportunities are accessible and everyone has a fair shot. This involves accommodating people's needs so everyone has a level playing field. And in order to make that playing field level, you might actually have to boost somebody up. So everyone has a fair shot at all of these great opportunities. And finally, inclusion is the practice of making everyone feel seen and heard, especially those who have been historically excluded. Um, inclusion is making that welcoming environment, um, making your team a welcoming place for other members. And inclusion is actually what we're going to be focusing on the most today. Why do these things matter? Why do diversity, equity, and inclusion matter? Well, people have different experiences and these, these different experiences create new perspectives. And in turn, these new perspectives foster creativity and bring forth new ideas. And that inclusion portion especially creates a welcoming atmosphere where people feel like they can contribute. People feel like they are seen, people feel like they are heard. And that's incredibly important for every team. So today we'll be focusing on certain minority groups within STEM. Um, uh, these are groups who have been historically excluded from this type of workplace. So um, in this graph, I've pretty much broken down um, the populations of the different populations and the demographics of both the United States and um, science and engineering uh, jobs. So you can see the blue job, that will be <laughs> the blue bar, that will be the percentage of that uh, minority group in the United States. So for example, there's about 50.8%, um, 50.8% is the approximated amount of women in America, women or females. Um, and then the green bar will show how many women occupy science and engineering fields. Of science and engineering jobs, which is closer to about 24%. Um, so let's, so the groups that we'll be talking about today, uh, sadly, won't, we won't be able to talk about every minority group because we don't have time and we might not have all the research we need. Like we won't be able to talk about religious minorities, but we will be able to talk about 
the LGBTQ community, people of color, women, and people with disabilities. All right, so for today, I'll be talking to you about the LGBTQ plus community. Who is in the LGBTQ plus community? Well, this is a very complex question because there are so many identities under this one community, right? So a broad overreaching definition would be that the LGBTQ plus community is made of, of people who have an orientation or a gender identity that's seen as different by society. Now this percentage we have here, 4.4% of adults, is actually um, a little bit outdated because the last time anyone took a survey like this was actually in 2017. And the US census doesn't actually ask people if they are part of the community um, as part of the census. So we don't actually have an accurate reading today um, in 2020 on how many adults in America identify as LGBTQ+. And we especially don't have an accurate reading on how many students, how many people in high school, how many people um, on your teams identify as LGBTQ+, because there are no surveys for uh, younger, younger Americans and children. So let's look at the letters over here in the corner. Let's dive further into who's in the community. Um, the L stands for lesbian and the G stands for gay. Now the B stands for bisexual or biromantic and the T stands for transgender. A lot of people end the acronym there, um, but we have two other things here. We have the Q stands for queer. Um, now queer is a reclaimed slur which means that in the past, it was used in a derogatory manner when referring to people who are in the community. Um, but now people have reclaimed it as their own and they use it to identify themselves. It's a very fluid identity. It, could, it, um, it covers a very wide span. It's something we call an umbrella term. And that plus is also a bit of an umbrella term. It encompasses all other identities that aren't listed, right? which is a lot of them. Um, a lot of identities aren't listed here in these few letters that we've got. So speaking of umbrella terms, let's talk about some hidden umbrella terms, some terms that you hear, but that you don't think are umbrella terms, but actually are. We've got gay. A lot of people in the LGBTQ plus community use the word gay to describe their identity, regardless of how they identify. Some bi people say, oh, I'm gay. Um, this doesn't invalidate their identity. It doesn't mean that they're not bi, it just means that sometimes they find it easier to say that they're gay. They find it more difficult to explain the nuances of their identity. Then we have bi. So the definition of bi is attraction to two or more genders. And this is so expansive because let's think about that gender spectrum, right? There, there are so many genders. To so just say two or more, it's just, there, it's just so expansive, right? So there are little lab there are labels underneath the bi umbrella, such as poly, which means many. So someone who's polysexual is attracted to many of the genders, and someone who's pansexual, pan meaning all, is attracted to all genders. Uh, someone who's pan can say, "Oh, I'm bi," and which is true, they're attracted to two or more genders. Um, sometimes uh, people who are pan and poly. Uh, specifically like to say I'm pan, specifically like to say I'm poly, you just have to do your own research. And then under the trans umbrella, we've got binary trans people and non-binary trans people. Binary means two, there are men and women. But non-binary is another umbrella term. See how big that umbrella is. So there are many different non-binary identities under that umbrella, including agender, which is no gender, gender fluid, fluid between genders, there's just so much um, that we can't talk about today, but if you do your own research, you can search all of them up. So what is discrimination? So discrimination is the unfair treatment that people experience because of the bias in others. Many people in the community have experienced discrimination in their lifetime. It's very real and very dangerous tool that weapon, very dangerous weapon, sorry, that bigots use to suppress minority groups. Now, especially in STEAM, some people in the community hide their true selves. They hide certain parts of their identity from coworkers, from team members, because they feel it's too difficult to explain or they fear the retribution that they would face if they were open. This can be super tiring for them. It can make them feel exhausted. It can make them feel claustrophobic even. 
So some examples of discrimination, which is what these people are trying to avoid when they mask these, this part of themselves, is the refusal to use the correct name or pronouns, not allowing a student to use the bathroom of their gender, making offensive jokes, or using, and slur using slurs that make um, others uncomfortable. The, the L members of the LGBTQ plus community face so much discrimination and oppression already that even just having one place where they feel accepted, where they feel totally comfortable can make a difference to a lot of them. And you want your team to be that place. You definitely don't want your team to be the first place where anyone experiences homophobia, uh, transphobia, or any type of discrimination. But that does happen. For example, we have a negative story here. After coming out as non-binary to my team, it says, a lot of people struggle with my pronouns. One team member in specific would always use the wrong pronoun for me and then make a big deal out of correcting himself. At first, I thought it was because he was learning my pronouns, but I soon realized that he was doing it on purpose to show me what a hassle using my pronouns was. It was embarrassing and it made me feel like I was being a burden. So what's going on here? Somebody is purposefully making a big deal about using somebody else's pronouns, saying, oh, this is too much work for me. Why would you do this? This, you can't do this to somebody because oftentimes when a person finds their pronouns, they've often struggled with these pronouns themselves. And when they finally come to terms with it, when they finally are like, this is mine, this is me, and they share it with other people, to face that um, rejection from other people is especially painful. So what are some good things that you can do to make your space more inclusive for members of the LGBTQ plus community? You can learn and use someone's pronouns. Always, always, always learn and use somebody's pronouns, even when they're not in the room, especially when they're not in the room. You can be open-minded. You can be positive when they come out to you. You can always be willing to listen to stories of discrimination, stories of homophobia, stories of transphobia. Always respond to them as well. Putting your pronouns in your bio is actually something very helpful. Also introducing yourself with your pronouns. Because when you introduce yourself with your pronouns, even though you're not trans, it makes trans people feel more uncomfortable introducing themselves with their pronouns. You can admonish others who make homophobic and transphobic jokes. Do not tolerate homophobic and transphobic jokes. And make sure you educate yourself. Make sure you do your own research. Now, what can your team do to be more inclusive? Make sure students are being called by the correct name and pronouns. So important. Address homophobia in your handbook. A lot of teams and schools have discrimination policies. Put that in your handbook. Um, you can become an LGBTQ plus a first partner team, which is something we're gonna talk about a little bit more later. And then there are little things, which may not seem like a big thing to you, but are a big thing to LGBTQ plus students. You can offer a pronoun pin or pronoun stickers, especially at competitions. Uh, you could hang up a little pride flag in your pit. You could hang up a little pride flag in your workspace to show that you're an ally, to show, um, to show that you support this community. And you can introduce yourself again using your pronouns. Now, here's a positive story. Once a friend of mine was excitedly telling me about his most recent competition. As usual, when he talked about first, the conversation started turning to why I should join his team. I was about to deny his offer again, feeling like it wasn't a place for a girl like me. But then he handed me an LGBTQ plus a first pen. I got it for you. I thought you would like it, he said. As he started to tell me the story of the girl who had given it to him, I began to feel like a door had opened, one that would allow me into a place that before was unreachable. I joined his team the same month. So what's happening here that's good? What went right here? Well, a team member reached out to his friend and told her that here, this is a place that's inclusive. This is a place where you can be yourself. And this is so important. Expressing that first is a place that's inclusive, expressing that face first is a place where everybody is included is a great way to get people to join your team. Here we go. Let's talk about people of color. This is the next section. All right, so who's considered a person of color? Now, people of color are non-white people and that's it. And this is such a broad definition, right? So many pe people of color have vastly different experiences from one another. 
Um, some examples of people of color in America would be indigenous populations, Asian and Pacific Islanders, Hispanic and Latinx communities, Black, Af Black Americans, Middle Eastern Americans, mixed people, and there were so many more, right? There are many different groups under this one all-encompassing term that brings them all together. Now, many people who identify as people of color also fight for the rights of their other, um, their fellow people of color. The reason to identify in this term is the unity that it brings, it brings them all together, right? But it's also important to remember that even though a lot of people of color face racism, face discrimination, um, the term people of color is not synonymous with marginalized. A lot of people take pride in that identity. They are proud of saying, I'm a person of color. Here are some common acronyms you'll see, right? Because you can mix and match and you can combine them. We've got women of color. You could be a queer and trans person of color, um, a non-Black people of color, a Black or an indigenous people of color. These are all because identities overlap, right? We talk about these sections as if they're separate, but identities can come together. You can be a woman of color. You can even combine these identities. You can be a queer woman of color. You can be a trans person of color. It's, it, it's all connected, right? So what do these things mean? Well, okay, especially black and indigenous people of color, um, because there's a, a bit of a history behind that term, right? So Black and Indigenous people of color is specifically used by Black and Native people of color to address America's history of suppression in these communities. So let's further talk about that suppression. Some people think that racism is a problem today, but it most definitely is. Um, it persisted throughout the decades. Many people of color still deal with systematic racism today. Um, and examples of that are lack of adequate funding and education for education in POC heavy areas. And um, people of color, students of color being more likely to be punished more severely than their white counterparts for the same um, infractions. And then there's the fact that employers are less likely to hire candidates with academic names. So here we have a negative story, right? My mom and I attended an unnamed off season in 2015, which had a primarily black school population as evident by in the athletic posters and photos of the students on the campus. My mother kept making comments about how poor she thought the school was or how black she thought the school was. And it made me so uncomfortable because I was competing with my friends and peers and they heard my mother's comments. It should have never even mattered in the first place, yet my mother decided to comment. So what's happening here? We have somebody who is generalizing, somebody who is equating black, which is a term that describes an identity, describes a whole group of people with poor, which just isn't true. It's a stereotype, right? But we also have something else happening here. This isn't happening to someone as much as somebody is witnessing this happening, right? So when you witness something that's happening to a minority group, when you witness discrimination, you can use your privilege to benefit that group. So let's talk about privilege. Privilege is the set of benefits a person receives because of certain parts of their identity. We all have privilege of some sort, right? Having privilege isn't inherently bad. For example, I live in America. That means I have free speech. That's a privilege. A lot of people in other countries don't have free speech, right? A very prevalent form of privilege, however, that goes unnoticed by its beholders is white privilege. White privilege describes the better conditions and treatment that white people receive in the art society here. White privilege directly affects the everyday lives of people of color, right? There's white privilege in little things. When you go to the store, you'll notice that they don't have as many darker shades of makeup. Uh, when you Google teenagers smiling, you'll find that a lot of the teenagers who are there are actually white. But then there's white privilege in big things such as native history being glazed over in class, teachers who skip it completely. There's white privilege in um, not having to deal with the weight of racism every day. Um, so people can use their privilege, however, in a positive way by speaking out against injustices that they witness, right? So let's go back to that example I said before. I have privilege, I have the privilege of free speech. 
I can use my privilege um, to speak out for others who live in maybe a dictatorship where uh, the person who is ruling over them is using their power unfairly and unjustly. I can speak out against those issues because I have the speech and I can help that population. So what can you do to help people of color? Always remember to check yourself and make sure you're not speaking over anyone. This is extremely important because you wanna help, but you don't want to be speaking over those voices who, that are already there. Understand how racism penetrates our daily lives. It's in every little thing. You may not even realize it. Using your privilege to benefit others like we just talked about, and especially bringing the conversation off screen because there are a lot of good conversations about racism and discrimination happening um, on Instagram, on Twitter, um, even on TikTok. But nobody's really taking that conversation out. Talk to your friends and family about it. And always remember, educate yourself. We've got some helpful resources here in the corner that we can talk about a little bit more later. How can your team be more inclusive? So here are some things that we did as a team that helped us. Uh, state you, that you are actively anti-racist and then prove it. Educate others about racial injustice. Educate, educate, educate. And you may think that it's not your place, but something is better than nothing. Please educate other people. Encourage students of color to join your team, of course. Now consider creating an effective DEI team. Effective is the most important word there. Because if you have a diversity, equity, and inclusion team, but at the same time, the students of color, the women on your team, the LGBTQ plus students on your team, the disabled the students with disabilities on your team don't feel welcome, then your team has failed. Another thing you could do is address microaggressions, um, consider as your tolerance policy, and remember, harshly reprimand the use of slurs or hate speech. So here we have a positive story. Let's read this. After our head mentor was made aware of someone using racial slurs on our team's Discord server, he sat the entire team down and had a talk with us about how he wouldn't tolerate hate speech of any kind. He told us that anyone who had used or continued to use that kind of language would face a hefty punishment. After that talk, I felt reassured at knowing that the mentors on my team would respond to discrimination promptly and seriously. I felt respected. So what's, what, what's positive that's happening here? This team directly responded to discrimination harshly. It's so important that you spot it, you talk with every member on your team, and you make sure that they all know the punishment. All right, let's move on to the next section. All right, section three, let's talk about women. First, I'm gonna go over language because you may be noticing that we've been spelling women with an X instead of an E. So there is a reason that we do this. Women spelled with an X is not only, does not only include um, binary women, but also feminine aligned non-binary people. It um, emphasizes, the, emphasizes the importance of including anyone in society who has that role of a woman or per being perceived as a woman because oftentimes they face the same issues. It also encourages people to research and think of different ways, think of all the different ways someone can be a woman. Um, so next let's talk about bias. So we have come a long way when it comes to um, women's rights in the workplace. Um, but we still do have a long way to go. For example, women oftentimes are presumed to be in, in, in operations. This is because it's tied to that more stereotypical role of a woman of someone who, who is empathetic, a people person, and um, works to serve underneath men instead of with them. A lot of women are discouraged from joining any sort of technical team in first or in or more like science and engineering jobs in the workplace. They're talked down to, their ideas are disregarded, and when it comes to the workplace, they're often not paid as much. Sometimes they will even have to fight for these positions that they are very qualified for. So let's talk about our first story in this section. 
It was the beginning of the season and the team was cleaning out our build space. Near the end of the meeting, we were going to vacuum. One of our mentors pointed at the vacuum and asked if anyone knew what it was. It didn't look like a traditional vacuum, but I still knew what it was. I responded, a vacuum. He replied, of course you would know that. I was shocked because I didn't expect that. As you can see that this, this comment um, affected the girl in the story pretty well. Um, she was once again stereotyped as someone who is a cleaner, someone who would be in a position of servitude, right? And so this often reminds me of like, if you're familiar with um, second wave feminists that happened after women joined the workforce, uh, there's this term that was used a lot called the second shift, which basically talked about how even now that women were allowed to work and have careers, they still were expected to take care of the home. So even though a lot of times we're moving forward, a lot of these expectations shift and like stick with us throughout time. So we have to make sure we're aware of everything that's going on so that we can account for that. So how can you be more inclusive? Let's talk about that. Number one, obviously, is don't turn anyone away because of their gender. This will make your team more diverse and it will allow you to have more, more ideas, which is already a good thing in itself. Additionally, let everyone work on whatever projects they would like to. Let everyone try different things on your team and so they can see for themselves what fits instead of just going with what would be expected for them to do. Remember to look at everyone on your team as an equal. Everyone has something to offer, different perspectives, and their own rich inner lives, which are important. Also, don't assume that all um, women who you encounter in FIRST are in operations. A lot of times people will ask some question related to like public relations or outreach to a team, and they will point that question at the nearest woman because they'll assume that she's the one who knows it. Instead, ask who was on that team. And maybe when you're introducing yourself, introduce yourself with what position you have. That way it'll encourage others to do the same rather than having everyone rely on assumptions. This is kind of similar to what Sid was talking about earlier with pronouns. It makes people feel more comfortable doing that too. Also, educate yourself. Maybe um, we'll have more resources for you to check out later that can teach you more about women in science and engineering. So making your team more inclusive. Once again, we want to discourage any generalizing. All girls are in PR, everyone in PR is like this. Um, things like that can all force people into certain boxes. If you've ever taken a psychology class, you've probably heard of labeling theory. And it's basically once you um, stereotype a group of people to be a certain way, they're much more likely to continue in that behavior because they feel like they can't escape that label. That traps people in positions that may not want to be in or make them feel like that they're not allowed to be who they really are. <clears throat> Next, encourage women to join any group they want. It's not just enough to not deny them. You also need to encourage them whenever you can. If you see someone who's nervous, maybe let them try a robot. Be aware that young girls are less likely to be taught things about science, engineering, math than young boys. So. They might not be as confident as, your, as their teammates. Also, they might have also faced some discrimination previously that, a lot, that makes them nervous about joining a group. They might have been made to feel or even just explicitly told that this kind of environment was not made for them. Um, yeah, just next we have stop stereotyping subteams, which I discussed earlier. It's very important not to stereotype and allow people to work in multiple fields. And to, it's also important to check in on women and just all your teammates and see how they feel. Make sure that no one, nothing bad is happening. It's good to check in with people and allow everyone to participate in um, team activities. Also, one final thing you can do is become a first like a girl ambassador team, but we'll talk more about that later. All right. So here we have our final story before we move on to the disability section. Um, 
Dur during many of the first meetings I attended in robotics, I was the only woman there. I felt out of place. Slowly, I felt the pressure many people in that position do to start changing the way I presented and take jobs that I would be more suited for. Then I met this mentor and she was this huge role model for me. She encouraged me to participate in activities I was actually interested in, almost forcing me at times. She also found ways to make me feel more confident about myself and my abilities. I would come to meet other women in, f in first and I found solidarity in them, they inspired me. This shows the importance of uplifting girls. As you can see that she started to feel like she was out of place there and having positive role models and not only multiple women in your, on your team, but also working as mentors and staff, that can have a huge effect on, on the team members. All right, let's move on to our final section, accessibility. Inaccessible spaces. So a lot of times people plan events with their own experiences and how they perceive the world in mind. So you'll make something in a way that makes sense to you. And a lot of times they don't take into account people who might have different needs. For example, you might set up a walk up an area and it, you think it's just fine. There's enough space for people to walk between them and it's comfortable, but you have not taken into account um, the fact that someone with a wheelchair might have a hard time navigating this area and getting through all the corners because you wouldn't think of that. So it's important to learn about other experiences in different ways that a person's disability might affect them. For example, um, if you make an activity that requires a lot of strenuous um, activity mandatory, that will exclude people who don't have the physical ability to do that from your team. Having bright or flashing lights might cause someone to be overloaded by all that sensory input, or it might cause seizures in people with epilepsy. And having areas that are cluttered make them inaccessible to people who have motor issues or who use mobility aids. We have, I have some more examples here that might help open your eye to things like that. Once again, we have narrow walkways and also things being only accessible via stairs. Now that one seems obvious, but if you walk into a venue and you don't have any problem getting inside, a lot of times we don't think about how someone else might have trouble getting in that and we don't put it into consideration. A lot of times even these bases will be available, but they won't be um, actually accessible. A walkway might be um, blocked by something or the ramp um, used instead of stairs might be too steep for someone to reasonably get up. Also having loud environments and strong scents can often trigger a sensory overload in people with autism, which can be a very painful and overwhelming experience. Having a lack of seats makes it difficult for people who can't stand or walk for too long. And um, having images on websites without also having image descriptions makes those images inaccessible to people with visual impairments or people who are blind. And these last two kind of go together. So instruction being delivered only through sound and videos without captions slash subtitles. Those things make that content and that probably pretty important information inaccessible to anyone with um, anyone who is deaf or hard of hearing. So our first story in this section says, after having a rough year health-wise, I felt like I was regaining some control over my life by taking on a role in the drive team. However, when I arrived on day two of comp, my head, coach, my head coach told me that I had been taken off the team due to my disability, mainly how it caused me to faint. It felt like a kick in the gut. I tried to explain that I knew how to manage my symptoms so I wouldn't pass out during a match, but he wouldn't listen. He told me his hands were tied because the mentors wanted me off the drive team. Later, one of our mentors came to comfort me. She said that she tried to convince the head coach not to take me off the team, but he was dead set on it. My earlier hopes had been destroyed, yet no one could be straight with me about what happened. What goes wrong in this story is that they don't have an honest conversation with this person about their abilities and, and how they can be on the team. They didn't listen to what they have to say and, and made that person feel less than and like they couldn't participate in the team, like they were some, a secondary member. 
This is why it's important to be honest with and treat people with disabilities with respect and make sure not to override their autonomy. Next, let's talk about some language. You'll notice that throughout this presentation, I, we have both been trying our best to use person first language. That means stay, statements like person with a disability, person with autism. A lot of times this way of speaking is preferred as it, makes, as it identifies the fact that this is an individual whose, whose disability or other traits might don't necessarily define them. This is a lot of times general practice. However, not everyone prefers this and that's valid. Some people prefer to identify themselves as a disabled person. This is because um, sometimes it's very difficult to get a diagnosis and once you're able to, it makes life a lot easier to live. And a lot of times people are proud about that. It makes them happy. Additionally, they sometimes the person with a disability makes them feel like they're distancing themselves from their disability, like as if disability is some sort of negative trait that they need to be, that needs to be disassociated from the rest of themselves. So it's important to ask people what they prefer and respect that to the best of your abilities. Another language thing that's important to keep in mind is hearing impaired, deaf with a lowercase d and deaf with a capital D. So hearing impaired can refer to any degree of hearing loss. For example, I am hearing impaired in my left ear because I can't hear about 30% of sounds. But I would not call myself deaf or hard of hearing. Deaf is a medical term used by people with more significant hearing loss. They may also use the term hard of hearing. A lot of them prefer that term. A lot of people prefer just deaf. Now the difference comes with deaf with a capital D. This is more used as an identity term and it defines someone who partakes in deaf culture. They probably have deaf family, they have a deaf school, they communicate through sign language. They might not use verbal language at all or know how to lip read. It, deaf can be a huge part of their identity and their upbringing, so it's more of an identity. Meanwhile, someone with lowercase deaf, it might just be a diagnosis, maybe they um, got it later in life or other, other factors might have contributed to them making that decision. And a lot of deaf capital D people do not identify as disabled. This is because when they're interacting in deaf spaces and in deaf culture, they can communicate and function just fine without being in any way impaired. It is only when they are partaking in the hearing world that they have some sort of impairment. All right, let's talk about a couple of misconceptions. Number one that I wanted to mention is that all people dis with disabilities look disabled. That is a big misconception, is that you'll be able to spot someone and immediately know that they have X problem and that they might need X accommodation. This is a lot of times not true. A lot of times people break this stereotype of a thin, more elderly disabled person. Instead, they might be young, they might have makeup on and be fashionable, they might be walking around animatedly, and you probably wouldn't notice in your day to day, if you're not actively interacting with that person, that they have a disability. So it's important to be aware of those around you. Um, quickly, let's go over some things to keep in mind. Always make sure to ask those around you because each person is different. Ask them what they need, how they like to be referred to, all of that. Um, be flexible and compassionate because people's disabilities are changeable and not everyone can control and no one can really control their state of health. The person who has a disability might have really wanted to come to something or they might not or interact with something but their disability might prevent them from doing that. Be flexible and compassionate and try to help them out if possible. But don't speak for people with disabilities. A lot of times people have the tendency to speak over them um, infantilizing that person with a disability because they might think that they need help. But a lot of times they know what they're doing and they know how to get what they need. They have experience living as a person with a disability. So don't speak for someone unless they specifically ask you to because they need it. Additionally, don't touch someone's mobility aids. Now mobility aids can be things like crutches, canes, walkers, and wheelchairs. 
those things are an extension of that person and should be treated as if that was like an arm, a leg, just so if you touch them, that is invading their personal space. And you wouldn't do that to just any stranger. Especially don't um, push someone's wheelchair without them explicitly telling you that you might, that you're allowed to. This is basically the equivalent of picking someone up and removing them. You're in that sense, the person who would be moving them would be overriding the person with the disability's autonomy, which can make someone feel bad and can make them feel afraid if they don't know where you're taking them. I have some more misconceptions listed here, which I've gone over. Another one that's important is that not everyone with a wheelchair is wheelchair bound and wheelchairs are not confining. In fact, they're often very liberating. It allows them to move and interact with the world more than they would be without a wheelchair. They don't view them as confining. Additionally, not all of those who use wheelchairs are wheelchair bound. There can be ambivalatory wheelchair users that only use them occasionally or when they feel certain, when, they, when their health is in a specific, sorry, only use them when they need to. So they can technically walk and stand, but it might be incredibly painful for them to do so. And they're unable to safely do it for more than a couple minutes. So making sure your team is inclusive. There are some things that you can keep in mind, like all the different ways that disability can affect a person's life that I've mentioned previously. Keep in mind to make sure to use inclusive language, make sure your teammates are also being inclusive and not saying anything that could hurt someone else's feelings. Make sure to share information about disabilities and keep um, people with disabilities in mind when planning events and, um, and organizing your workspace. Speaking of workspace, let's talk about how you can make that inclusive as well. So here I have some questions that you can ask yourself to make sure that a space is welcoming to everyone. Remember, if you don't have these kinds of things in mind, it might make a space inaccessible for someone, and suddenly they're unable to participate in something that could be a really big, important deal to them, or maybe it just makes them feel other and like they, they're, they have to be separate from all the able-bodied people who are capable of doing those things. So try to keep your walkways open, have everything organized, avoid things with strong scents, sights, strong scents, noises, um, or avoid, <laughs> sorry, um, or give a warning before it's, um, causing that stimulus to appear. Um, keeping areas well lit, don't exclude, don't exclude people on basis of ability and, and learn some important words in ASL, like how to introduce yourself, how to ask for someone's name and maybe anything that might need to be used in an emergency setting like ambulance or help. All these things can pr are probably relatively small for an individual to do, but they can make of a world of a difference for a person with a disability. So we have our final story here before concluding our last section. During a team meeting, our operations group was working in a room with our software and finance teams. The room grew crowded and loud as everyone began talking. And I found it really difficult to focus. Someone suggested that we moved to somewhere quieter and I agreed. Our group went outside where it was less overwhelming and continued the rest of our conversation there. I felt like a weight had been taken off my shoulders. So this is a very nice story because these people were aware of how this might present a challenge to the person in the story and um, pretty quickly easily accommodated that and that way they were actually able to get work done and finish the conversation and be productive. There we go. All right so that concludes our final section. Before we end this presentation we have a couple more things we we're going to talk about. For example, ways to learn more. I personally think that educating yourself is a very, is one of the most important things when it comes to being a good ally and making sure your team is accessible. Don't just listen to what we have to say, go and listen to a diverse amount of individuals 
and so you can gain a well-rounded understanding of minority experiences and how you can be an, a good ally to those minorities. Here I have listed some people who most of all have like YouTube channels and social media that you can go check out where they talk about these issues in uh, an easy to understand and, and um, accessible way. Some books you might wanna read and then some other things that might be nice to include. We will have this presentation we should have this presentation available for you guys to see otherwise, so you can look through it at your own pace. All right, so um, being an ally to these minority communities that we're talking about is incredibly important. There are some things that you have to know in being an ally. Um, there is this thing called performative allyship, right? Performative allyship is um, the promoting of a social issue for class or for popularity. For example, uh, performative allies will say they want change and they'll be an ally to that community when it's popular or trendy per se. But when less people start looking, less people start, um, or when people move on to something else, those allies move on as well, leaving that community high and dry. Genuine allies continue to unlearn their bias, continue to fight for the rights of others throughout their entire lives. Being an ally is a lifelong task, right? And because being an ally is a lifelong task, it can be really tiring fighting against these big issues, discrimination, racism, ableism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, all these things. Um, they can take a toll on the victims, but they also can take a toll on the allies. So allies often fight until they can't fight anymore. And then they have to drop out of um, helping that community completely. They have to stop attending events. They have to stop posting things on social media and take times for themselves. Um, but this can be a negative thing because a lot of times those allies, they don't come back. So that community loses that ally, loses that voice that penetrates um, different spheres, right? So allies need to know when to take time for themselves when to take care of themselves, and then when to rejoin and come back and help those communities again. And then another thing that you have to be aware of is information overload. There's so much information out there on the internet. There are so many resources. We, the, our last slide, we have so many resources there, but there's just too much information for any one person to digest and understand in even their lifetimes. There's just so much out there. So what you do have to do is take it slow, understand all of that information, try to, um, one good thing to do is look at maybe a one resource a day, really digest what you're, and understand what you're reading. Um, and be aware that when you share these things, if you share 50 posts in one go, Nobody is going to really look through all of these 50 posts, but if you share one good post with um, friends, with family, and you say, hey, can you read this? And maybe we could talk about it. Just that, it means so much more than mass sending out 50 posts. All right, you might, have rem you might remember me mentioning earlier, first like a girl. So it is this social media movement created to encourage girls in the first community. Um, girls can send in videos and stories from all the world to inspire each other and it fosters this sense of community. It's important because it helps um, empower girls in STEM, makes them feel like they can belong and encourages them to fight against any stigma that they face and participate in what really interests them. You can help or join by using the first like a girl hashtag on your social media post, or you can become an ambassador for First Like a Girl and even hand out pins at events. Also, it's good to share a lot of the hashtag First Like a Girl posts on your social media. Um, another organization that we talked about earlier was LGBTQ Plus of First. Uh, which is a group dedicated to uplifting LGBTQ plus people in first and in STEM. 
right? They promote an inclusive and welcoming environment for people in the community, which is so important because it makes young people feel like they have a place to be themselves as well as letting them know that there are people like them in science and engineering fields. Um, you can show your support for LGBTQ plus affairs by being in contact with them, um, becoming a partner team. Uh, they, have a, they have three different levels of involvement, bronze, silver, and gold. Um, FRC Wingspan, us, uh, we're actually a bronze level partner team for LGBTQ plus affairs. And I'm also an LGBTQ plus a first ambassador. So I, you can trust me when I say this organization, um, really good stuff, really good work. Uh, they have a Discord, they have a Facebook and you can check them out at that website right there. Now, um, we talked about diversity, equity and inclusion today. And this might've been maybe one of the first resources that you've come across, but first actually has uh, diversity, equity and inclusion training for students and mentors but many teams are unaware of this helpful resource. There's an unofficial group called Equity First that advocates for FIRST to better promote their EDI resources. Right? Equity First was inspired by an Instagram page called Dear First Robotics, which is um, a page that has stories of uh, teams, team members and volunteers and people in FIRST who are experienced racism or discrimination or uh, homophobia, um, transphobia, sexism, harassment, any type of uh, bias, they have all of these stories of people who were really hurt by their experiences. Um, I do suggest that you go and read some of those stories because they're really eye-opening because you don't realize that these things are happening in FIRST. Um, and here Equity First has a uh, petition demanding that FIRST headquarters officially pushes their EDI training and resources, and you can sign it here. And again, like Ale said, um, we will be sharing this presentation um, on our Instagram page. So you should check us out there. That way you can come and find all of these links. Yeah, speaking of our Instagram, here it is. Um, you can go there to check out um, more information about our upcoming conferences. We will probably be talking about these same topics, but in more depth so that it's easier to digest and you can have more um, well-rounded information. We'll also be promoting that on our Twitter. And um, our YouTube is where we'll probably end up posting those conferences afterwards. So if you wanna check them out, you can go there. Um, also on our Instagram, we have created a Black Lives Matter Instagram highlight that way that we hope will educate on racism in today's society. Now you can become a better ally to people of color, especially black people of color. And if you have any questions or stories to share about these topics that we've talked about today, we would really appreciate um, you sending them to the Google form in this um, presentation so that we can use them in our upcoming diversity conferences. All right, and uh, finally, we would just like to say thank you so, so much to FRC Team 2614 Mars for um, hosting this live stream. We really, really appreciate you guys letting us do this presentation and talk here. It means a lot. Yeah, and also thank you to all the volunteers who made this possible. We really appreciate this opportunity. And lastly, we'd love to thank you guys, the viewers, the people who are watching this right now. This wouldn't be happening without you. Yes, thank you. We know that's a lot of information, but it's really important. Thank you for listening. All right. Now we're gonna check the chat and see if you guys sent in any questions and then we'll try and answer some of them. Okay. Already. All right, so we do have a question. All right, how does your team specifically foster inclusion, somebody asked. Um, I know that a lot of the things that we have recommended here um, are things that we actually do as a team. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, actually a lot of these stories because um, 
we didn't really open up our form yet. We didn't really have a chance to get stories from other people. A lot of these stories actually came from our team, which is how we know how to respond to them, how we know how to identify the problems, how we know how to fix them and make them better. Um, oh, wow, you guys have a lot of questions. That's great. Okay, uh, let's see. To finish up the answer for the first one, I do know one example we have. We actually recently made pronoun stickers um, on our team that we hope to share uh, the PDF of, um, especially if we go to competition, we were hoping to hand some of those out. Uh, and we find that they're, uh, I think a lot of team members really enjoy them as well. So here's the next question. What does your team's gender breakdown look like? I'm not actually sure. I know that we've gained a lot more diversity on our team than in our first year. Our team has only been, a, this is going to be our third year now. And the amount of change that we've seen is actually quite a lot. Um, uh, let's see. I don't have our demographics memorized off the top of our head. Um, off the top of my head, but um, I yes, just like Ale said, we do have a lot more girls than we did last year. Um, we do have a lot more people of color than we did last year, or not last year, but I mean in our first year. Um, we are really trying to expand and create a more diverse and inclusive environment, which is one of the reasons why we made this presentation. Um, um, really quick, if I can answer the ASL question. Of course, so, yeah. There are actually a lot of resources online you can use. A lot of bookstores also have ASL books that will tell you a little bit about grammar structures. On YouTube, they have channels pretty much dedicated to ASL, ASL stories. And if you go to the website that's titled Sign Savvy, it is like this database that has videos about every single um, commonly used ASL words. You can look them up if you need them. Again, that's sign savvy. Yeah, another resource that I also used, um, I think it's called LifePrint. I found that to be pretty helpful in learning some ASL. Uh, wow, okay, let's move on to, let's go back up actually, to how can my team support BLM without getting into the politics of the year? which is a pretty hefty question. Um, thank you for asking. I think what we decided as a team was that we were going to focus on the people because there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of things happening right now, some of which we can't talk about due to the politics again, which is why this is somewhat of a difficult question to answer, but focus on the, the black people who are being affected by this. Focus on um, the names of the people who were victims of systematic racism today. Um, focus on black lives, focus on racial inequality in today's society. Um, it's important also to try and share the, some of that knowledge you have, try and educate people, which is one of the things that we're trying to do with our Black Lives Matter um, Instagram highlight. I'd recommend checking that out. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not speaking over you, but I like to view it as a way of uplifting the individual, like as Sid was saying, focus yeah. more on that rather than all those political issues. Exactly. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, we got uh, two more questions. Two more questions here. Let's see. Does your team have a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement? Um, I don't know that we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. We do have a Black Lives Matter statement. And um, I believe we have changed our missions and vision statements. I don't know if um, we've officially changed them on our websites yet. But we have changed our mission and vision statements so that they are more um, inclusion focused. 
um, yeah. because that is always our goal as a team to be the most inclusive environment, um, to make the most inclusive environment as we can. Uh, if you wanna check out our Black Lives Matter statement, you can check us out on our Instagram. Um, it's posted there. Let's see, and then I believe this is the last question. This is a very important conversation, but a tough one. What inspired you guys to become so passionate about this? Uh, that's a really good question. You, you wanna go first? Uh, no, why don't you go first? All right, so for me personally, uh, <laughs> it's been, it's pretty much been a long road of have, of not only being like Hispanic, struggling with like health issues and um, trying to get, you know, disability diagnoses and also being friends with a lot of minority groups. Uh, and a huge part of that was facing discrimination in school. And um, when I, when I first moved to like the United States from Puerto Rico, I didn't know much English and that really started me down this road of seeing just how much inequality there was. Sid? Um, well, for me, it's, of course, it's an important conversation, but for me, it's also a personal one, kind of, um, because, um, I mean, I'm Black, so um, a lot of the stuff that's going on right now is really important to me. So I found, I think it's really important that our team would talk about it as well. Our team would share information about how you can show your support. Um, but also being a non-binary person as well, um, I just really wanted to make sure that we kind of were able to discuss some of these issues, uh, some of the discrimination, some of the problems that these communities are facing some of the problems that all of these minority communities are facing and inclusion, inclusion, inclusion is like super important. And I just wanted to be able to talk about that with um, uh, all of these other teams, all of these other people who are here and just share how you can become, how you can become an inclusive team. All right, so it is 5.59, six o'clock, wow. Um, <laughs> so that means our slot is up. Again, thank you all so much for coming. Next, we have another slot, actually. Um, we're gonna be playing Minecraft.